What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the Club Metaverse podcast. I am Mark Fernandez, and I am joined today by cosmologist, theoretical physicist, and one of my personal kind of intellectual heroes, Dr. Lawrence Krauss. How are you, Mr. Krauss? I'm fine. It's a beautiful day where I am. <laughs> yeah, it does I look know what it's like where you are, but anyway. <laughs> it's hot, muggy, but beautiful as well. You know, we live in a beautiful planet. You know, that's yeah. the good news. Uh, so, so just look, just to jump right into it, um, I, I unfortunately I haven't read your latest book, but I have seen it. I, I did already get the Amazon, and I'm very intrigued by it because it's a topic that I wouldn't expect you to tackle necessarily, given that I know your historical kind of intellectual pursuits, mm -hmm. um, and and it's a book that completely goes around the concept of explaining what climate change actually is how to be more educated about it, how to be able to have better conversations with people about it. And, yeah. and, and that's a very interesting topic, given that it is such a kind of hot button issue. And I think people kind of over politicize it to kind of figure out where you stand on which side of the line. Are you a, you know, are you a good guy or a bad guy? Tell me your take on climate change. This is actually a very fascinating topic. And I kind of skipped all your wonderful work, but I want to chat about this for a little bit. Oh, okay, sure. Well, it's you know, look, it's not not a book I expected to write. I wrote it during the when the pandemic first began, and everything I was doing was canceled. All my travel was canceled, and I was trying to think how I could do something useful. And I'd just been in Vietnam and Cambodia, leading a trip there, and which is, as I say in the book, the perfect storm when it comes to climate change. Mm. But what what I what I realized was missing. That was fun for me to do. I mean, it was an amazingly different book than anything I've done, and. And working 18 to 20 hours a day on it, I was able to finish it in 12 weeks instead of 12 months or two years, which is what my normal rate is. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea was, you, as you said, it's politi politicized and it shouldn't be. And the point was, I have a lot of friends and on, on different sides of the aisle. And, and what happens is that um, people get people immediately close their mind off when they think it's, it's, you're presenting a, a, this is what you need to do. You need mm -hmm. to do this. You need to do that. A lot of people say, well, you know, that's a, you have an agenda. And so the idea was just to write a book about the science of climate change so mm -hmm. that, so that any of our discussions, if they're going to be rational, should start from there, should accept the facts and, and understand them. And it's not just listing facts, but have a basic understanding because as I point out, it's not rocket science. I've written books about rocket science, <laughs> not rocket science. And, and so the idea was to write something where, since I believe that the fundamental physics is understandable and comprehensible, and actually turns out to be kind of quite fascinating historically, mm -hmm. write a book which would just say, here, you can understand what the issues are, what the underlying science is, and you can see why it isn't speculative science about the future. It's 200-year-old science. And, and then from there, you can talk about policy. So there's no policy discussion in the book. It's really a discussion of trying to understand the, the science and pointing out the the challenges and and in some cases the the the, the warnings about what needs to be done but but uh I, I wanted it to be something so that people would in principle open their minds they wouldn't feel they were being told what to do i one of the people i had in my mind actually when i was writing it was a friend of mine Penn Gillette, mm. uh from penn and teller magician yeah yeah he's a, he's, i'm a big he's, fan he's a libertarian and I know he doesn't like to be told what to do. And and if I was, you know, talking about it. And actually, I was very happy, basically, when I wrote the book. He said, this is the book I've been waiting for. So, you know. so in your findings, in your kind of research doing the book, um, did you kind of land at a, at a place where there has been sort of irreversible damage done by humans that we've kind of crossed past the line? Or, or is this something that's kind of more of a warning that if we continue on this path, we're going to cross that line. Well, we've already crossed a bunch of lines. And nothing's, uh, in a sense, nothing's irreversible. It just may take a long time. As I have, as I point out in the book, I, it's, it's, it's. I think I call it the Las Vegas effect or something. But you know, as far as car carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere, what happens to the atmosphere stays in the atmosphere, right. <laughs> and and, uh, and it takes about a thousand years for that to change. So we've already, and and that's the other thing that I point out is that. Climate change has already been happening. It's not something in the future. It's already happened at some level. And the part and, and the real part is trying to understand what's happening and realizing realizing what we need to do to at least accommodate and deal with what's been happening. And in particular, recognize that 
as I say at the end of the book, fortune favors the prepared mind that hmm. knowing what's going, what, what, for example, what's happened already is there's going to be a half a meter sea level rise this century pretty well. And I think you said you are down in the Florida Keys and you better, yeah. you should think of selling it soon. <laughs> <laughs> Never. They're going to have to bury me there, but yeah. yeah no. <laughs> but, uh, but, and so that's pretty well written in stone and there's not hmm. much you can do about that. And, Recognizing that simple fact means we got to realize, well, maybe there's six to eight hundred million people around the world who are going to be affected by that, and we should we should start thinking about that. Not because it may fe- affect us wherever we live it directly, but the socio political ramifications of that many people say losing losing their livelihood and 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 or their 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 homeland is is going to be dramatic, and so we've got to sure. think about those things. And this this uh, rise in sea, sea level, and pardon me for not knowing the details on this, but is this a cause of the like polar ice caps melting? No, well, actually, melting? what's really amazing, and one of the things I, I learned about when I was working on the book, although I kind of knew some of it at the beginning, but I wasn't, I was really surprised. One of the reasons it writ, is written in stone. Yeah, there's a lot of there's some uncertainty in terms of the Greenland melting and Antarctica melting, although there's a lot of data, and I I go over it in the book, but uh, but half of that. Fully half of that is just the simple fact, which is irrefutable. You could do it in a high school physics class, that when you heat up water, it expands. Mm, and if you think the amount of heat that's been dumped into the oceans over the last 50 years, that still hasn't been equilibrated. And just that that net average temperature rise will raise sea levels by about a quarter of a meter. Oh, just wow. that. And it's already in there. As I talk about in the book, uh, the amount of heat we've dumped in to the oceans from additional absorption of 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 uh, well additional absorption of radiation from the sun that isn't re-emitted because of the trapping in the atmosphere that's something like 3.5 billion hiroshima level bombs jeez exploding the water over the last say 30 to 40 years that's five bombs every second 24 hours a day you know every day 365 days a year that's a lot of energy and do you think that the sort of cumulative cause for all of this, if you really had to sort of, you know, boil it down, is the burning of fossil fuels? Is that really what? Yeah. What essentially? That's the large largest part of it. Is is human generated uh, uh, carbon dioxide through the burning of fossil fuels and and some other greenhouse gases? But yeah, we've oh, no. you know we've taken we've taken what took the planet hundreds of millions of years to to generate in terms of sequestering that carbon dioxide uh, in, into organic materials. And, and we're, we're, we've exploited it in about a hundred years. Yeah. It, it's, I know that you love kind of the, you know, the idea of using pop culture as a vessel to kind of talk about science. And last night I was lucky enough to see the kind of Miami premiere screening of Top Gun uh, Maverick. Oh, and, I was going to see that. It hasn't screened here yet. Anyway. Uh, it, it, it's first of all, the movie is absolutely amazing, but when I left the movie, obviously I was very tickled by the movie. I thought it was great. But in my brain, I'm thinking how many dinosaurs were combusted in the creation of this movie, you know? Because yeah. like you could probably do the math exact, and I'm sure it would be a ton. Be a lot. Yeah, it'd be a lot. It'd be a lot. Um, so do, do you think if you could snap your fingers a la Q to kind of bring in a little bit of a Star Trek reference, if you can snap your fingers and change one thing, about what humans need to do to kind of, you know, uh, temper this climate change crisis. What what would that be? Well, I wish there was. That's the point. It's it's there's no silver bullet. Mm. I mean, there's there's lots of little things. There's lots of things that need to be done. Obviously, you know, looking at at, at fuels, including nuclear power, that don't you, that don't generate carbon dioxide is one. But I, I think mo- I think in the near term recognizing that it's that, that that it's an inevitable problem especially for the third world mm-hmm. and realizing what has to be done in preparing that infrastructure in Africa but also in more important equally importantly in in um, in, in low-lying lands like Cambodia and Vietnam I mean where the the Mekong River feeds 60 million people with rice but sure. but if when it becomes brackish like the water right outside my house right now mm-hmm. um, it's not. It's going to be mangroves, <laughs> and right, uh, right, and um, but just thinking about what we can do to moderate that and and recognize the existing problem, I think is probably the most important thing. And then there's lots of little incremental things we can do in terms of conservation, in terms of effect, looking for sustainable uh, 
energy sources, but we have to first of all make sure everyone has the right infrastructure to 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 move on. But and, and you know anyway, there's a lot. So I think like many things, recognizing the problem is the hardest part. As I say in the book, the problem isn't technological; mm. it's political. Right, right, because it's somehow become this thing about. Yeah, which is not, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me how it became such a political kind of, you know, one side, other side. You yeah, know, well, kind you of know, I think there's a lot of money involved and that causes people to generate arguments that make, that make, you know, that, that benefit them. But I also think it's something like what we, what's often called the tragedy of the commons in the sense that mm. it's the kind of thing where, well, if I do something, but they don't do something, then there's no point in my doing it. Right. And so. Right. It, 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 it's the first. It's essentially the first time that humanity's really had to deal with a truly global problem that can't be solved by one country or one group. It, it, ha- it has. It, it's going to require a, a, a cooperation globally at some level, and that we just haven't, not as a species, ever done that. Yeah, yeah, and you know, kind of to jump um, because I know you know I want to be very respectful of your time, but um, and I have a couple of questions here I want to ask. Um, sure. One one thing that, you know, just to take it back into the, you know, Star Trek world, I know one of your, you know, famous books and and people got to know you through the physics of Star Trek and mm-hmm. you did your show with William Shatner and how Shatner changed the world. And, you know, it, it's very well documented, you know, um, um, you know, the, uh, oh my God, I can't believe I'm, I'm brain farting on this one. Um, um, the great physicist who wrote the foreword on your book, Stephen uh, Hawking. Stephen Hawking's, of course. You know, so so you know, you've been through all this gambit, and 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 you've said that your favorite episodes of Star Trek, the ones that that really got your mind going the most, were the time travel episodes. Yeah, and and then famously, you quote that Stephen Hawking's told you, well, you know, I can prove that that time travel is not real because if it were real, we'd have people visiting us all the time, and you. Very, you know, funny said that you know they all went to the 1960s, right? So and nobody noticed, yeah. And right. nobody noticed. So my question is, you know, there's been a lot of kind of during the pandemic, there was this kind of news cycle that was very subtle but very interesting to me about these flying TikToks and these UFOs and all this kind of oh, yeah. stuff, right? And people obviously their first thought is that these are interstellar travelers, and to yeah. me. In the story that I know of, of of the universe and the physics and our place within it, it seems more probable to me that it would be easier for somebody to travel back in time and have a TikTok than it would be for somebody to travel across, you know, the stars and and get to us. What, yeah, well, you know, I don't know whether it's easier, but it, they're both they're both, <laughs> they're both highly unlikely. Let me put it that way. I mean, it is so. It amazes me, and it, you see it all the time. Whenever it's like whenever there's something unexplained, oh, it's aliens. Right, um, you know, in, in other contexts, it's God, but it, but in the case of, of of seeing things in the sky, it's always got to be aliens, and well, we're primed for that with our TV and movies. But if you look at the science of it, and I talk about that in the physics of Star Trek, and then again in a in a book I wrote afterwards called Beyond Star Trek, um, the, the as as Richard Feynman said, I think uh, aliens, uh, you know, ob- reported observations of aliens or whatever, it's much lo- less likely due to the known rationality of other species and much like more likely due to the known irrationality of humans. Right. Uh, and right. because almost any explanation you can come up with as crazy as it might be makes more sense than, <laughs> because, you know, to, as I, as I talk about in the book to take a spacecraft and move it near the speed of light, a spacecraft big enough to contain people and, and equipment and everything else, or people like things that, you know, a massive spacecraft, uh, would require more energy than there is in the, in the observable universe, basically to, to sure. Do. And, and even, you know, even if you could change things and use different kinds of tricks, it would still be equivalent to the power output of a star. And I, as I say, think I said in the book, maybe uh, I have a hard time imagining that some advanced civilization would harness what is equivalent to the power output of a star to come all the way here and, and kidnap and do weird kinky experiments on a few humans. I mean, <laughs> So, so given that you're an insider, one of the you know brightest minds of our generation and of multiple generations at this point, with all due respect, um, what what's your kind of take on this whole TikTok 
phenomenon? Have you had any inside conversations I mean, about it? Or you know, look, look. I mean, I think first of all, when you have a lot of people shoot <laughs> putting cameras and other things up in the sky, you're going to get strange things. I mean, it's just yeah. it's always it's you know it's something we physicists learn actually. If you do a particle experiment and you take enough data, you're going to find some really strange stuff. And the thing we teach ourselves is to not make assume that weird stuff is significant mm. because you'll always statistically get strange events that seem like something is happening. And we have to say, well, okay, but if you've looked at enough of them, what's the likelihood of getting something strange? And then you say, well, it's not so, not so strange. I, I think the example I often use is, uh, which I may have gotten from Richard Feynman was, um, you know, you have dreams every, every night and, and, you know, they're crazy most of the time, but one night you dream that your friend breaks their leg. And then next day, you know, you call them and they and they were in a car accident and they broke their arm or something like that. And say, right. Oh, goodness, I dreamed about it. And you say, yeah, but how about all of the thousands and thousands right. of dreams you've had that were nonsense that didn't do anything? But you always, we always ascribe significance to things we see. And it's like Fox Muldar says, I want to believe. We want to believe there's stuff out there. It's nice to think we're not alone. But but if if you're looking at a lot of stuff, you're going to see some strange stuff. And, and... And the other thing people don't realize is a lot of what they used to call UFOs, and now I think they have a different name for, is all that meant is that they were identified. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that they're aliens. It means that we couldn't didn't have a clear explanation of what they were. But, but there's a lot of stuff I see that I can't identify, and myself, and I don't ascribe that to be aliens. It, the, the the physics is so is such that it's so hard to it's so implausible for so right. many reasons. That that we would be being visited. Not that aliens don't exist on other around other stars. That's I think highly likely at some level in our galaxy. Although sure. I think it's also highly unlikely we'll ever know about it. Right. It's a big, it's a big place. But uh, but you know I think lately it's that and the idea that you know when you have it's not just more observations. You got a lot more people now. In the old days to get a report out, you had to go to your paper or do something, and now. You just have TikTok. You have it's the same problem. <laughs> Everyone no pun problem. intended. Yeah. You got seven billion or five billion people. Or how many? What a fraction of the eight billion people on the planet are? You know, two billion people using the internet. You're going to get a lot of people reporting strange things. Yeah, it's amazing because in uh, in Star Trek: First Contact, which is one of my favorite Star Trek movies, yeah. when they get to to Earth and the Borg had taken over. They say, "Oh, the planet Earth has nine billion people." Like this was some number that would never happen yeah you know it, like 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 in nobody's lifetime only some crazy space age thing and look we're almost we're starting to push that reality we'll, we'll, we'll definitely get we'll get to we'll get up to 10 billion people as i suspect and 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 or close to it and you know we're well on track it's hard to imagine not being there you know i was going it dates me but i remember there were two and a half billion people when i was young so and I believe in 1940 was when we flipped over to one billion, right? It's it's a it bigger been, spike. It, than... I mean, it's certainly it's certainly like like many things, a kind of uh, polynomial, if not exponential growth. I mean, and um, and of course, it's turning over in certain places, and I think it's going to turn over naturally. Um, but it's but it's still an issue, and I, and there's certainly. If you ask what's the biggest problem about climate change, it's probably the number of people on the planet. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to say. It's like, you know, like I used to be really big into fish tanks. And, you know, the one thing that always gets me out of the hobby is this concept of bio load, right? You get too excited about putting more bio load in the biosphere. Yeah. And you end up destroying it, right? Because they just can't sustain that level of, yeah. of yeah. And biology. I mean, and, you know, the planet can sustain... Well, maybe the planet can sustain as many people we have now. I mean, food-wise, it can, but there are lots of other issues, and um, and uh, uh, that's an issue that people have to face. But these things are not politically correct to talk about limiting the number of children. We encourage people to have more and more children as if it's a great gift to the world. Sure. And and you know, it may be a personal gift uh, for some people, for others not. Uh, but it's it's something we have to think about ourselves as global citizens it's like um it's like rousseau once said which is you know everyone's man was born free but forever is in chains we have a social contract and at some point at some point we have to think about the fingerprint we create and we didn't have to for a long time for humanity and now we do and, and you know you, you've mentioned richard Feynman a few times and 
I look at Richard Feynman as kind of like the godfather of, of scientific evangelists <laughs> and one of the first ones to start bringing this information to the people. And then Carl Sagan, of course, like yeah. that's sort of early. And I would consider you obviously the next generation that came after them. Did you know Richard Feynman? And maybe that skipped my little historical knowledge of you. Yes, I did. Yeah, I did know Richard Feynman and he had a huge influence on me. In fact, a huge influence in the way I just, I not only do physics, but the way I, uh, I, I describe the world and the way I, uh, um, yeah. So I think he had a big influence. I knew him when I was a young person. I, I wrote about it. Actually, I wrote a scientific biography of Richard Feynman. Oh wow! Okay, I gotta check that the out. Only one that's there. It's one. Of my, it's a. It's called um, Quantum Man, and um, and it, it, there are many things I like about that book. Uh, it was a, it was a labor of love uh, because it, I, I agreed to do it when I was asked to do it because I would knew it would force me to read all his papers, which I probably wouldn't otherwise. But it, it it's also one of the only books that I don't think has ever gotten any bad reviews. But um, <laughs> uh, but it it it's got a, one of the fun things about it, which may or may not be relevant. It's not really relevant to science, but I, I can't resist. Is that sure? Um, a, a, a friend of mine who's a writer named Cormac McCarthy, um, who you may or may not know, but his books are very famous. He's one only one the Pulitzer Prize, but his books like No Country for Old Men and Oh wow, okay, yes, of course. Um, of course. Uh, and so. Um, Anyway, he 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 read the hardcover and said, I, "I love this book. It's perfect, but it's not perfect. It's almost perfect. I can make it perfect. Let me copy edit the paperback." And so I said, "Sure, of course." And so he copy edited the paperback. And if you get the paperback, and it says with edits by Cormac McCarthy, and I think the New York Times picked it up because they were kind of amazed that he edited a book on a quantum scientist. But 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 I'm very happy to have his name in one of my books. Well, oh, man, now 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 I want to check out the paperback version. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did did were you one of his students? Was he? Uh, no, no, I no, I I wasn't a student of uh, Feynman's, but I well, I, I mean, I knew met him a few times. I I give the story of it in that book because uh, uh, it's to some extent poignant. But I was a student at a, and um, when I grew up, this this organization that I was an official of, a, uh, actually, I grew up in Canada. It was the Canadian Undergraduate Physics Association. We managed to have him come up and 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 be a speaker and and. Um, and that was the first time I met him. And, and I, I had one, my girlfriend came with me at the time and she was one of the few women around. And so he spent most of his time. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we spent the weekend together. Yeah. And then later on when I was at Harvard, of course, I, I lectured at Caltech a few times and, and I tell a story in the book, which I won't go into, but it's, it's sort of sad for me because uh, I lectured and he, he, he came up and, and a a afterwards and, and, and one last question, there was a very annoying assistant professor who kept, wouldn't go away. And eventually Feynman walked away and, and I said, well, I'll catch him later, but then he died shortly afterwards. So oh, I want to let yeah. him remind him that I was the young guy from the floor, but he... Yeah. I mean, there's, there's still some gold for people that are listening. There's some gold. If you just, you know, YouTube, Richard Feynman, some of his explanations of, of, of things are, is just, Great. you know, you know and as I say, I certainly think of him as, a, well, I mean, I don't put myself on that scale. But he certainly was a strong influence in the way I both think about physics and the way I present it. Yeah. So one one last thing about the aliens, and I'm, I'm trying to sort of condense here, you know, keeping my eye on the clock. Okay. Um, there was a gentleman that I interviewed on the show maybe a few months ago. His name was Dr. Avi Loeb, also from Harvard. Oh, yeah. I know uh, Avi. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and Avi, you know, obviously uh, kind of became sort of mainstream famous after this discovery of this interstellar space object no oh, no claimed was an alien spacecraft yeah that was his claim that's yeah his, that's well, he, he is to ride on that alien spacecraft <laughs> on, into the public sphere yeah what what was your take on that Umula nonsense Umula? nonsense, nonsense. Mm -hmm. was it based on the data that that, that no, I, mean, look, I, mean, or? Uh, I don't want to talk, i mean no no no, no. It, it's I mean, just, look i mean it just it's one of those things that you know there's it's a very unusual object but to jump into the assumption that it's aliens is a huge leap without any evidence. Sure. And, um, and, and, you know, you can make some interesting calculations and Avi does that a lot. He just sort of calculates things and, Hey, this is amusing. And, and, but, <laughs> but I think it pushed it. I, I don't think generally the problem I have with people who write popular books on their own little ideas mm -hmm. is if they haven't, you do a disservice to the public. If you, and I know a lot, I have a lot of colleagues who do this. You know, they write a paper that no one, none of their colleagues buys and has no impacts on the field whatsoever. But they mm -hmm. like it, and they write a whole book about it. 
And the public gets the notion that somehow this is some big issue. And it's really distorting because I can, you know, the public it relies on people like me or Avi or other people, scientists. And so I can say anything I want and people will in some sense say, ooh, neat, you know. But so I have an obligation as a scientist and as a popularizer to not m- knowingly misrepresent the status of the field or what we know. Mm. Now, of course, I unknowingly probably do it. And, and people may take away from what I say things that are different than I intend. And that certainly happens. I know for having written books for 30 or 40 years. But, but you know, Avi wrote a paper to this effect about, about this possibility. And it had no impact on the field. Sure. And people just thought, okay, yeah, that's amusing, but it's no, and, and, and um, so I think, I think my problem is, it's not that, you know, the science isn't amusing to think about, but it gives the wrong impression to people. Yeah, because, you know, the the whole premise was based on the fact that when Oumuamua went around the sun, it picked up speed and this yeah. was able to be calculated and it was antithetical to what the prediction was. Yeah, but you can imagine happen. lots of, I mean, you can imagine ways, and Avi has tried to say those ways are not likely, but I know colleagues who said, no, there's, you know, uh, uh, there's uh, um, uh, not evaporation, but, but um, um, yeah, I forget the word now, but where materials are, are uh, uh, not ablated either, but, where yeah, yeah, it's a cosmic, are... cosmic uh, jetting of some kind. Yeah, I know exactly yeah. you can what... imagine uh, sublimation. That's the word I'm looking at. Mm. And um, and so there, there are different ways to imagine this is happening. And and a single, I mean, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Sure. And I don't think there's any extraordinary evidence there. Now, Avi might, well, he would undoubtedly disagree, but he's he's a he's a he's a group of one. <laughs> and sure. I, I think I I'd la- I would dare say. That the re- that on the whole he hasn't convinced anyone else that that, that 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 that's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, that that seems to be the case, and I think he understands that, internalizes that pretty well. Yeah, he does. He, but, but you know, but it was you know, it's very. I I don't want to go into for. Look, I know Avi, and and he and he's you know he's a very prolific scientist, and uh, and I've worked. We were on a team together trying to develop a spacecraft to go to the nearest star. For a Russian billionaire was funding yeah. it. This is the Galileo project, or no? It's called Breakthrough Starshot. Oh, okay, but, um, yeah, yes. So we, I've worked with him a lot, but I think it's very tempting, as a scientist who's been in the public sphere a lot, mm. it's really tempting when there's interest. And if you mention aliens, you can get interest, and it's really tempting to play into that interest uh, when you're when you're writing a book or when you're talking to journalists, and so it's really tempting to try and please people to go where they want to go. And it's really hard. It's not so exciting. You wouldn't see an MSNBC report saying, "Guess what? Scientists have just decided this 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 uh, meteorite or, or asteroid is not a, a UFO." There's not going right. to be a nightly news report on that. <laughs> right, right, right. That's a fair point. Um, what one one thing um, you know um, that I kind of want to jump to here, or one one thought that I was having as you were speaking, in something I've heard you say in the past that's always kind of stuck with me is that most uh, theories in physics are incorrect, you know, well, a, 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 and that that's part of the game, right? It's about eliminating yeah. the possibilities. Well, yeah, and by incorrect, I mean not that they've made a mathematical error. It's just that they don't correspond to nature. Right, right. There's and no if, they pre- weren't, if it weren't that way, then anyone could do physics, right? I mean, yeah. it just so happens you come up. I've written a lot of papers which I thought, well, nature is just really a shame that nature isn't smart enough to adopt what I've argued it should be doing, yeah. but, the, but, the, but unfortunately nature is the arbiter of, of what, of what works. And, and so most scientific theories, especially forefront scientific theories are wrong because we're, we're, we're sort of grasping at straws and we're, we're at the edge of knowledge. My new book, by the way, which I just finished four days ago. Well, congratulations. Um, it's called the, the known unknowns. And it's about what we know. We don't know about the universe. And, and when you get to the edge of knowledge, it's really kind of that's where that's where you have to recognize that people are that lots of possibilities exist. They only those possibilities only exist at the edge of knowledge. It's not as if anything we're going to discover now is going to change the fact that if I take a ball and let it go, it's going to fall. Mm. So people have the wrong idea about scientific revolutions that somehow we'll discover something and everything we now know to be true will be false. And that's just never going to be the case. But at the edge of knowledge, there's a lot. Almost anything goes. And. And physicists are are creative enough and driven enough by by the desire to get funds and 
continue their jobs to come up with almost any explanation. And maybe one of them's right, but most of them almost always wrong. Yeah, the um, one one of the things that uh, I've I've always kind of you know held on to is, and I remember seeing you at the World Science Festival like seven eight years ago already in New York City, and buying my ticket and seeing you on stage and loving every moment of it, and, and thinking uh, something that Brian Green said in an interview that I did with him that science is really about the ability to have accurate predictions, you know, and that something, if you discover some kind of data set that is pretty good at predicting things, then it has some scientific, uh, you know, strength. Well, predictions, I mean, science, yeah, because it's what makes science different than storytelling. Mm. Uh, Science has stories to tell, but it adds predictions. And that's everything, because then you can test them. And if the predictions are are wrong, then you throw it out like necessarily newspaper, regardless of how elegant the theory is, and Brian, of course, and I have had some disagreements about the likelihood the string theory is, say, going to be correct for that reason. But sure. But um, but you know, but the point is, those people are honestly trying to come up with something where they can make prediction that this test is not as if they're trying to avoid that. Um, they're they're good scientists working hard. Um, and. and, and- Mm-hmm. And to focus in on the string theory thing a little bit, do you think that string theory um, has done a decent job? Because I know it's impossible to sort of test its metal, so to speak. But do you think that string theory has done a decent job at being able to predict things? No, it hasn't predicted anything yet. Right. right. <laughs> um, but, but, but that's not to say it's not been useful. The ideas from string theory have been very useful in other areas of physics. And they, they provided new ways to calculate things that we couldn't have calculated otherwise. Mm. So all of that work, all that mathematical work hasn't gone to waste. But, um, but in terms of making a prediction about the universe or explaining any observable that we've seen, string theory has yet to, to do any of that. You know, you, you've, um, in one interview, I know that you mentioned that, that you were pretty close with another physicist um, who recently was uh, responsible for the discovery of gravitational waves and that amazing experiment with those two out, outposts, one in Texas, the other one in Seattle or something incredible yeah, like that. The ones in Louisiana, but you're not far. <laughs> yeah. But the point is they're far away from each other. They were calibrated to this exact moment and they were able to detect these gravitational waves. And when I look back at the history of physics, um, gravity has always been at the sort of center of man's greatest sort of like pivots, you know, from Newton to Einstein. And then, you know, that's why, you know, like I had that sci-fi story that I was working on about Mm. the discovery of the graviton. Mm. Do do you think that that is the next thing that's going to happen is some deeper understanding of gravity or, or have we kind of reached the sort of glass ceiling for the understanding of gravity? People always ask me what the next big thing is. And I always say, if I knew I'd be doing it. (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) But, But the point is that We've known for some time that gravity and quantum mechanics appear ir- irreconcilable, and people have spent a lot of time trying to make them reconcilable, and string theory is one attempt to do that. Hmm. Um, it, it, and it's a very exciting area of thought, and it'll be necessary to have such an, a theory, or at least an understanding, if we want to understand the beginning of the universe, for example, or what happens inside, deep inside black holes, both of which I again talk about in the new book. But, hmm. but, but... It's not. It's interesting because it's not. It's been touted as a theory of everything, but it's really a theory of very little. Because mm-hmm. while it's essential to understand the beginning of the universe in the center of black holes, almost all of what we understand about the universe, we don't need a theory of quantum gravity for. And there's lots of other things to be discovered. So it's in terms of fundamental physics, it's one of the. It's one of the biggest uh, mysteries and biggest um, challenges, and 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 and. Uh, and therefore, people have a lot of people have been putting their energy into it. But there's still lots of even at fundamental scales of the, about what, the nature of elementary particles and the forces we can measure that we we don't understand. And so there's a lot of things uh, out there to think about. It's very sexy to think about a, th- a theory of quantum gravity. And I am sure, like any other th- young theorist, I was seduced by thinking about such things when I was when I was a graduate student because it's such mm-hmm. a clear and obvious goal sure a recognition that until you have a theory of quantum gravity you can never really understand the universe at all scales so as a long-term goal it's fascinating but in terms of understanding the universe it's really you understand 
very, you know, localized parts of it. And albeit at the beginning of the universe is a very important part of the universe. Sure. But, and, and, and did, did the, did this kind of conf the confirmation of gravitational waves get us a little bit closer to understanding this potential? Not directly. No, not the uh, gravitational waves are classically are, are a phenomenon of classical general relativity. It's a sure. beautiful prediction of classical general relativity, which I thought would never be testable. And it is, and it's one, it's a, it's a testament to the ingenuity of, of, of experimentalists and their, and their, their patience and, and perseverance that, that we've been able to, 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 to see them. But more generally, if you, it's the beginning of a new field and it's possible. And as we look at new types of gravitational wave detectors, including using the universe as a gravitational wave detector, um, it, then it's possible we might be able to probe regimes where, where quantum mechanics and gravity are, are relevant together. But the, but the observation of gravitational waves from colliding black holes, as it's been seen, are really confirmations of, of classical general relativity. And, you know, maybe I think eventually... Every time you open a new window on a, a new window on the universe, you're surprised, and mm. this is certainly a new window on the universe. So it will come up with lots of surprises. What one interesting thing? Um, why is it you think, as an American scientist, somebody that represents your community, you're involved at all levels of this stuff? Why is it that America has kind of quote unquote fallen behind in the world of particle physics? We don't, we're not really conducting a lot of experiments here in the mainland anymore. It's not. It doesn't seem to be as big a deal as it was back in the day with the Manhattan Project, et cetera. Yeah, no, no, it's certainly true. Uh, I mean, I, I concerned me for a long time. I should say I've left America, so it doesn't bother me so much. But, <laughs> right. but, um, uh, but, but uh, the problem is one of um, of explaining to the public the need to to fund science appropriately, and and the United States was in the position of having of building the biggest. Ex particle accelerator in the world that would have dwarfed the one at the, in, in, in Geneva mm. and have built it 20 years earlier. Um, and, but, but we decided that spending $10 billion was something we couldn't afford to do in 1992 at $10 billion total, not $10 billion a year. Sure. But that was, that was in a day when $10 billion seemed like a lot of money. Right. And, 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 and uh, and for reasons that really didn't have to do with the science, the United States uh, Congress decided to stop funding for it. And the real problem is the fact that the United States is one of the few countries, Western countries, and maybe one of the few countries where large scale um, uh, government appropriations for funding science can be undone the next year by the next administration. So, so that the, the super, super collider had been proved by, I think by three American presidents that was killed by the fourth. Okay. And, and, and that's just the way it is. Every year, you have to go through the same hassle. And so instead of saying, we are committed to this, to building this, and we're going to do it, it's we're committed now, but tomorrow we may change our minds. And you've seen that in some sense in the in the, in the, in the Apollo space program, okay, where, where mm -hmm. you know, we sent six missions or seven or something to the um, six missions, I think, maybe seven, to the moon. And they just said, okay, done it, been there, done that, let's not like, and I'm, I must say, I'm not a big fan of human space exploration, but, but you know, it's just. Uh, but uh, this, but it's a fascinating point because the privatization of space exploration is happening right with Elon Musk and SpaceX yeah. and and all of the stuff that he's doing. It just and I can't believe I never thought about this before. Do you think it's possible to privatize the study of particle physics? And is that no? And I don't think it's possible to privatize ultimately the study of space either. I Elon, what, no, I mean there's. They're, Private industry can do certain things very well, and the United States and the government, by the way, sort of created the, the whole paradigm of orbital of, of of orbital space exploration around the Earth, and now it's appropriate having that we know how to do it that 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 private industry follows up and tries us to commercialize that. But private industry is not going to explore the universe, and it's not even going to explore Mars. It's not. It's just too expensive. I, I you know, it's just not going to happen. The only right. way it's going to happen is if we, if the government, then we're talking about hundred or hundreds of billions of dollars to, mm. to send humans at least uh, to Mars and and back appropriately, and and um, uh, you know that's the only kind of thing that industry isn't going to do because there's no, as far as I can see, there's no build business plan. Now physicists are there are enough billionaires and soon trillionaires in the world that that it's sort of becoming like like 
the medieval times or the Renaissance times, <laughs> right. where there are patrons. Sure. So you can have a, 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 someone who has a few hundred billion dollars saying, remember, the whole budget of the National Science Foundation is something like $10 billion. Right. Funds all of science. All, now, and the Department of Energy funds particle physics and, and other areas. So maybe another five to $10 billion. But but there are individuals nowadays who can devote that kind of wealth to these things. And so so there are areas of science where people are choosing patrons to try to help it. I don't think it's going to happen in particle physics, but it already happens in astronomy and other areas. Yeah, the 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 barrier to enter in particle physics seems so high because it's all about making more energy, right? Like well, you... it's not just it's not just the difference is it's not just the money involved and the required to it's it's you have in a particle physics experiment, now you have 10,000 PhD scientists who are right. working to build that. That's not the kind of thing that private money does. I mean, sure. and, and so uh, uh, it's just a whole different scale of activity. Uh, and so it's, it, you know, there'll be, there'll be donors who will help, help in individual universities or institutions build devices that might be used in particle accelerators. And that's, I'm sure, happened and is happening. Um, and and just like there are well in, in astronomy the big telescopes are essentially built by private private foundations the Keck mm -hmm. Foundation things like that where, where they're funding the big telescopes but the, but the the scale of what's required to really probe the ultimate energy frontier is just a different thing altogether and 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 uh, while it, it would be nice for private individuals to, to help out it's not going to happen and it's not and the thing is it's so large. That nowadays, I think we realize that one country isn't going to do it. That's why CERN, which is uh, an amalgam mm -hmm. of many different countries, is sure. probably the leading place in the world because because uh, many different countries contribute to the to the global project. And as I understand it, CERN is actually looking to expand its outer ring to create higher. Well, yes, well, impact. CERN is certainly expanding. Look, we're looking at the next accelerator, and CERN is considering. You know, it's certainly one of the places. There's other. There's places in China. It's not what about crazy. Antarctica? Is my is my prediction going to come true? You think? No, no chance in hell. No, right? I don't think so. <laughs> right. But I think it's equally. I think it's. I think China may be. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Well, look, we've we've gone on for about forty five minutes here. You've been so generous with your time, Dr. Kraus. I'm so honored to to get a chance to chat with you. The Origins Podcast. You can check it out on everywhere you get your podcast. You can check it out on YouTube. Um, and, you know, Lawrence Krauss is like an endless, you know, wealth of interesting tidbits and facts and info. So please check out his work. And it spans for over a decade now because I've been listening to you, for, you know, for years. I knew oh, you oh, before oh, I knew Bitcoin. Try, try three decades. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're, you know, you've been influencing my mind before I even knew what Bitcoin was back in, you know, the, you know, the early uh you know, teens or whatever. Well, there we go. I mean, and that makes me feel old, but that's good. Yeah. All right, Dr. Kraus, thank you so much for your time. And um, thank you all for listening. And we will see you on the next one. You take care. It's a pleasure. I'll come back sometime. Thanks. Cool. Bye-bye.